Peter Hahn, and I'm privileged currently a service department chair. Uh, I'd like to begin our welcoming this afternoon first by calling forward Dr. Steve Millette. Steve is a PhD grad of our department and one of the co-founders and co-directors of the Clio Society. He's going to talk just for a moment about what we try to accomplish. Thank you, Peter. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm really pleased with how many people have uh, shown up. And uh, I'm very pleased with the age range. <laughs> because uh, what we say is if you loved history as an undergrad, you're going to love it now. <laughs> so uh, what we have found is uh, there really is lifelong learning. It's not just something that people say to be nice or to be impressive. So this is an organization which is informal, casual. We meet two or three times a year. The goal is to get people together of different ages and different backgrounds, uh, people to share their love of history and uh, to take part in, with the faculty and to get to know each other. It's an extended group where we want to have young people and old people uh, like myself uh, get together in the forum uh, to exchange information and ideas. Um, we do not have dues. We have no obligations. <coughs> Uh, but we are supported by uh, the Goldberg uh, Center. So what I do is when I make my annual donation to Ohio State, I designate the Goldberg Center as, as my target, and that way I can help out a little bit. And David Staley is our speaker tonight, um, who is the director of the uh, Goldberg Center. And I'll make one more comment. I love his title, because I saw in a TV show or a movie one person said to another, now, do you really know what you're talking about, or you just Google know what you're talking about? <laughs> so I think we're in for a very uh, pleasant session. Thank you, Steve. And now let me introduce our featured speaker. Uh, Dr. David Staley is an associate professor of history here at Ohio State. I, I believe he's well known to many of you, and I'm uh, not surprised that he drew such a nice crowd this evening. As Steve said, Dave is also serving currently as the director of the Harvey Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching, uh, which focuses on enhancing the learning experience of OSU students, especially in history classes, but increasingly all over campus. Dave is well educated, I must say. He holds a BA in history from Ohio State University and an MA in history from Ohio State University and a PhD in history from Ohio State University. So we're, we're very proud of him as a, as a uh, Triple Crown alum. He did seek his fortune and uh, began an academic career elsewhere. We were delighted to lure him back to campus about 10 years ago. Uh, he's been doing exceptionally good work as uh, the director of the Goldberg Center and, and associate professor of history. Dave is well published. He has three books to his name. The first was entitled Computers, Visualization, and History how new technologies will transform our understanding of the past, published in 2003, second edition in 2013. That was followed by History and Future, Using Historical Thinking to Imagine the Future, published in 2007, paperback edition in 2010. And then very recently, uh, Brain, Mind, and Internet, A Deep History and Future. Uh, Dave's gonna address some of those issues this afternoon in the talk title that the screen suggests. Is Google making us stupid? A deep history and future of the internet. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Staley. And thank you all for uh, for joining us uh, late this afternoon and before the dinner hour on a Friday. Uh, as uh, as uh, both uh, uh, Peter and Steve suggest, this is uh, a, a regular sort of uh, lecture series that we organize out of the Goldberg Center. Uh, I don't know if it was ever by design. Uh, but certainly by practice, it seems that uh, the, the, the lectures that we've given in this series have all uh, had a commonality to them in that uh, our lecturers, our, our, my, my, my colleagues in the history department, tend to choose topics that uh, are of contemporary relevance, or at least that place contemporary events in some sort of wider historical context. Peter was a, a, a Clio Society speaker about a year or so ago. Uh, Peter is an expert uh, in American foreign relations, and in particular, uh, U.S. relations uh, in the Middle East, and specifically Iraq, and gave a, a, an enthralling talk on the century-long history of U.S.-Iraqi relations. And I think that anybody that's going to think seriously about the Middle East needs to rely on experts uh, like Peter to give, to, to give guidance. Um, 
it seems that uh, historians are frequently called upon in moments of national crises in particular to give context and a sense of, uh, of, of events. Uh, we saw this certainly after 9-11 uh, where it seemed that whole week historians were on rather frequently and the questions were all of, of the type, what does this mean? How, help us make sense of this. Is this like Pearl Harbor? Is this like uh, the Vietnam or the Tet Offensive? And historians uh, oftentimes are called upon to make sense of cataclysmic events. I think with Clio Society and with one of the publications that we have from the, uh, the Goldberg Center, Origins, Current Events in Historical Perspective, I think you get a sense of one of the things that we're quite interested in in our department is helping to make sense of current events. And I'm going to put in a plug for Origins. If you go to origins.osu.edu, uh, we hope that you'll become a regular reader of Origins. It's, it's free, widely available on the net. Um, uh, we don't charge any sort of subscription, but I hope you'll become a reader. This is our current uh, 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 issue, uh, uh, the role of big government in American history. And again, looking, going back to the foundation of the Union to try to understand the role that government has played um, in American history. It's with that spirit in mind that I wanted to think about uh, the Internet and what our current internet moment means. Because in my sense, uh, historians should be called upon not just simply to talk about cataclysmic events and not just simply to talk about uh, 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 extreme events like war in the Middle East, uh, but we can also talk and give context and meaning and sense to a wide array of contemporary issues. And I think uh, the meaning of the internet is certainly, uh, certainly one of these. Uh, I wish I could take credit for the title of my talk. I'm actually borrowing it or drawing from an article that appeared in uh, The Atlantic by Nicholas Carr uh, about six years ago. And he has since written a very thoughtful book built uh, off this article. But he asked, uh, is Google making us stupid? And in particular, I don't know how well you can read this, but it says, what the internet is doing to our brain. And that's the real sort of concern right there. And I think given the contemporary interest in zombies, it seems to have a sort of a resonance, right? Something's happening to our brains. It's not just Nicholas Carr. There are other very thoughtful observers who are asking the same or similar sorts of questions. John Brockman, who's the editor of, uh, of The Edge magazine. It's a, it's a contemporary affairs uh, publication, largely from the perspective of scientists asked a very similar sort of question. Is the internet changing the way you think? The net's impact on our minds and future. So this is clearly a topic that is of, of contemporary relevance. And a, a large reason why I wrote the book that I did, the book that Peter mentioned, was to try to put some historical context around this question. Because I think the discussions that we are having about the internet's effects on our brains is uh, ahistorical largely ahistorical. People like Carr, for instance, when he says that the internet is doing things to our brains, is pointing to recent neurological studies that suggest that the more we use the internet, the more impact it's having on our brains. And I, when I say that, I mean physically. It's physically altering the synaptic pathways. Our brains are being physically refashioned because of the increased use of the internet. And this is a horrible, dangerous, disquieting thing, event. That's essentially, and I'm simplifying, I hope you understand, I'm simplifying a Nicholas Carr, but not that much. It's a, it, is a, uh, it is a cause for alarm and concern, and we have to do something about this. Uh, I make, uh, uh, I'm not going to stand here tonight and say that the, that the internet isn't changing our brains, because it is physically changing our brains, and it is indeed changing the way we think. But when we look at this across the broad sweep of human history, this is not, a, this is not new. This is hardly a new uh, uh, event. In fact, it's, it's, it's the playing out of a scenario that's occurred countless times throughout human history, going all the way back to uh, cave paintings, as I'll show here in just a second. Uh, the internet is changing the way we think. It is changing and altering the very structure of our brains. And that this is, this is a typical historical pattern. Uh, I've drawn in particular from the work of two philosophers, two cognitive scientists and philosophers. Uh, Andy Clark and David Chalmers, who wrote uh, a really important, really seminal article in 1998 uh, that introduced what's called the extended mind hypothesis. And again, if I can simplify a really complex philosophical argument, it's that our thinking doesn't just stop with our brains. 
to say that we engage in thinking as human beings means that we use our brains plus some sort of de device in the external environment, some sort of tool, some sort of technology, that it's our brains plus our tools and technologies that allow us to engage in thinking. That's, and, and we're gonna point to examples of this uh, all along. We engage in cognition together with our technologies. Ours is a, in their words, a hybrid mind, which I think is a really nice way of, of thinking of it. And this has been occurring long before the internet came along, long before the internet. Here's the, uh, here's the calculation I wanna make, or here's the equation uh, I wanna play with throughout the, the, the course of this lecture that the brain plus cognitive technologies equals our minds, or cognition, or thinking, whatever sort of term we want to use for it. But that the tools are an integral part of our thinking, integral to this. Uh, our brains, historically, our brains begat technologies that we use to engage in thinking that at the same time changes the very brains that begat them. That's the, that's the sort of circular rondo I want to, uh, I want to play with uh, over the course of the evening. One of the people who responded to or wrote to John Brockman's uh, uh, collection of essays was the playwright and director, Richard Foreman. And uh, he's, uh, you can tell he's a playwright and director, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> but I think he summarized very nicely uh, and, and very thoughtfully the argument that's being, uh, that's being made sort of against the internet or the caution that some are, 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 are posing about the internet. He says, I come from a tradition in Western culture in which the ideal, my ideal, he says, was the complex, dense, and cathedral-like structure, cathedral-like structure, of the highly educated and articulate personality. A man or a woman who carried inside themselves a personally constructed and unique version of the entire heritage of the West. That we, rate, that we maintain that within ourselves, within our brains. But today I see within us all, myself included, the replacement of complex inner density with a new kind of self, evolving under the pressure of information overload and the technology of the instantly available. He doesn't single the internet out by name, but it's pretty clear what he's talking about here. A new self that needs to contain less and less of an inner repertory of dense cultural inheritance, as we all become, in his words, pancake people, spread wide and thin as we connect with that vast network of information accessed by the mere touch of a button. As I'm gonna demonstrate later, it's gonna be even more than just a touch of a button. It's gonna become even easier to connect. But he says all sorts of things right here that I think are a conceit of Western philosophy, that our thinking, of, and this is since the time of Descartes, we think with our brains, and everything else is either a distraction or some sort of, uh, uh, it gets in the way of our thinking, and that the difficulty, the, the problem with the internet is that for the first time in human history, we're being inundated by this alien force that's changing the way that we're thinking, not just the patterns of our brain, but how we actually think. It's, emptying us, emptying us of our cultural inheritance. I think he's wrong. I think he's very thoughtful. Uh, I, uh, I, I find it very persuasive, but I also think it's very wrong. Uh, and I, again, I say this as, uh, as an historian. And when I was asked, uh, the, the initial uh, impetus to write this book was to respond to this question about the impact of the internet. They said they wanted me to place it in context. I said, okay, I'll place it in context. Let's start about 40,000 years ago if you want to place it in context, and start with cave paintings. Now, prehistorians and archaeologists debate about what the particular function of cave paintings were. Uh, some have suggested that it was a record or the memory of a hunt. This is what we did. This is, uh, uh, this is what uh, my colleague did in killing, uh, in killing this bison. Others have suggested it's a... Uh, it's, it, it's almost a sort of a religious offering. We'd like there to be big bison so we can kill them, right? So we'll draw a picture of them so that we can ensure there'll be bison for us to hunt. But whatever the case, what human beings were doing were taking thoughts in their heads, in their brains, and storing it outside their brains, on cave walls in this case. But this was the beginning of, of I would make the argument, this is the beginning of what uh, we call information taking thoughts and ideas in our heads and storing them outside our brains in some sort of material form. Cave paintings were sort of the first instance of this. Uh, the psychologist Merlin Donald refers to this, uh, this sort of external system 
as the external symbolic, symbolic storage system. We offload symbols onto the environment, making these permanent and also making us capable of storing information, recalling it, reflecting upon it, and ultimately building upon it. When we talk about cloud computing today, we talk a lot about, or at least technologists like to talk about cloud computing. Uh, I think that we've been surrounded by an information cloud at least since uh, the first cave paintings. And we've built upon that. We've, we've accumulated such symbols over time, including uh, uh, writing, for instance. Writing is a perfect example of this. And I'll talk about writing here in a second. But thinking about offloading our ideas, thinking about offloading symbols on the environment is, I think, um, uh, the, the best way, a healthy way of thinking about the impact of the internet. We are, we are a species built from our technologies. Technologies aren't separate from us, in opposition to us, something that is uh, a threat to us. Technologies are us in the same way that the web is a spider or a, a shell is a snail. If you remove webs, you don't have a spider anymore. A web is as, as intricate to the spider as the shell is to the snail as technology is to human beings. It's what defines us as a species. It's what, make, it's what makes us different from any other sort of species. And so we've been offloading, doing our thinking with technology um, at least for the last 40,000 years or so. Uh, I don't know what's happened to this. I'm trying to fix it on the fly and lecture at the same time. So uh, uh, we'll see what we can do here. Uh, but I, want to start, I also want to look at writing, because writing is something, of course, that we all like to draw uh, attention to. We all uh, think of writing and books as, uh, as uh, important skills that all educated people should uh, learn how to engage in. Think about the history of writing. Think about why human beings developed writing in the first place. Uh, when societies were simple, hunter and gather societies, you didn't need writing because most information could be stored uh, in the brain. Maybe there'd be some wall paintings or something, but most information could be stored in the brain. When, as societies grew larger, as civilizations and cities grew larger with thousands and then tens of thousands of people, and they started collecting taxes and they started bringing in levies and they started having to count people and their occupations, you couldn't keep all that information stored in your brain. And so the er these early human civilizations developed writing. In fact, most uh, archaeologists will say that most writing systems began as counting systems. And then they later evolved, they later evolved into what we would think of as literature. But they, they really did begin as counting systems. In fact, if you read sort of early written texts, they're actually kind of boring. Five oxen, six jars of wine. I mean, they're really quite dull to read. The point is, is that you needed that kind of storage, mental storage system, in order to keep track of all the goodies and all the stuff that was coming, um, that was coming into cities. That's why we developed writing, the written word. We offloaded some of our cognition onto these tools, onto written tools. And then as a result, now we're able to engage in a kind of cognition that we weren't able to engage in before, because now we have writing. Now we can store information, we can store stories, I can pass it on to someone else, I can pass it on to, uh, to, to, to future generations. Writing, or the brain plus writing, means a kind of thinking that we can't normally, or that we, that we wouldn't, ordinarily, never, wouldn't ordinarily engage in. And I want to be clear about something here. It's not that the brain could have engaged in this kind of thought, and writing just maybe sort of helps it out. We simply could not engage in the kind of thinking we do without the invention of writing. We, we're, different, we're different species now because we develop writing. Uh, there's a terrific uh, story that I, like to, uh, that I like to quote here from uh, Richard Feynman. Again, the slides are working. I, showed you, I, I would show you Richard Feynman. But uh, he was talking with his biographer, the historian, Charles Weiner. <clears throat> and uh, Weiner discovered a series of documents. Historians love documents, right? Discovered a series of papers where Feynman, the, ph the great physicist, had uh, scrawled out some equations. And the historian, of course, was really excited about this because here he has a record of Richard Feynman's thought. And uh, Feynman said, uh, no. In fact, he kind of shot back uh, in, in, a, in a kind of crisp way. And he goes, no. He says, I actually did the work on the paper. And the historian said, well, sure, the work was done in your head, but the record of it is here. 
And he says, no. And he's really mad about this. He says, no. He says, it's not a record. It's working. You have to work on paper, and this is the paper. In other words, the historian was thinking, well, all the thinking was occurring in his head. And the fact he sort of wrote it down afterwards you know, gives us a permanent. He said, no. I needed the pencil and paper in order to engage in the thinking that I want to engage in. You can't separate Richard Feynman from the paper. <coughs> Feynman saw it in this way. And that's the way I'd like to describe our relationship to technology, certainly to cognitive technologies. We need these tools in order to engage in the kind of thinking that we engage in. Paper, and I hope it's fairly clear from this, paper and other such objects are not uh, doing the thinking for us. So they're not themselves engaged in cognition. We think with these tools. No one is suggesting, although there are those who have uh, argued um, to Andy Clark that he's uh, that he's saying um, is that, it possible uh, that it's the projector and not the projector? That um, I I don't know. That I'm, I'm like I said I'm trying to do this on the fly here. Um, no one is suggesting, and people have attacked uh, Clark and Chalmers by saying, "Well, you're saying that the pencil and paper are somehow thinking." They're saying, "No, it's not what we're saying at all." Right? That we engage in thinking with our tools. Although that's going to become important tools thinking when we start talking about uh, the internet. Uh, I wanted to uh, be able to uh, show you, in fact, I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to sort of describe it in words, I guess, but I was going to show up here an image of St. Jerome in his study, which is an iconic image in, uh, in, in Western art. But the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the great Christian saint uh, is depicted in many, many paintings, uh, sitting in his study with his books and globes and calipers. And that's an image that I want to play with uh, throughout the throughout the rest of the of the talk, this notion uh, of of Saint Jerome and his study. Because when I look upon that image, I don't see someone alone within the cathedral of his mind. I see someone thinking with his books and globes and calipers. In fact, he needs his study to engage in the kind of thinking in which he's engaged in. The study is not incidental. It's Saint Jerome in his or and his study. There's a reason why that, uh, that we like to show him. In other words, the, the St. Jerome plus his study equals his thinking, equals his cognition. As I said, in starting with cave paintings and starting with the earliest instances of, 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 uh, of human information development, uh, archaeologists in particular have been leading uh, a, ra a rather important change in our thinking about uh, human development, human evolution. And archaeologists and prehistorians are saying that things have been altering the brain, have been altering our minds since, thank you, have been altering our minds uh, since even before the first civilizations, even before the first cities. By the way, this is St. Jerome in his study, and I'm glad we have this up here now, uh, because this is an image that I want to return to, or several images that I want to return to. But I want to draw attention to the work of um, Lambros Malafortis, for instance. Uh, again, uh, an archaeologist. Um, who has written a book recently called How Things Shape the Mind. He's approaching this from the perspective of an archaeologist. He says, things, and we're talking about all manner of things here, affect extensive structural rewiring by fine-tuning existing brain pathways. You'd think he's talking about the Internet. In fact, he's talking about things like uh, early cuneiform systems, for, for instance. Generating new connections within brain regions or by transforming what was a useful brain function in one context into another function that's more useful in another context. Uh, brain scientists, neuroscientists, cognitive scientists have demonstrated over the last 10 years or so that our brains are plastic. Even at the age for most of us in this room, our brains are still plastic. The assumption up till about a decade ago was that our brains are changing up to about the age of 10. And then they kind of harden and solidify into the brain that we'll have for the rest of our lives. And actually proved that's all wrong. It's, it's, it's all wrong, even into, I don't know what age, old but age. even into old age, <laughs> we can still be affecting, we can still be changing our brain structures. And so uh, archaeologists have been using this to say that our brains have been altered by our tools because our brains are so plastic. This goes back to early cave paintings. The neuroscientist Stanislaw Dehaney has studied children learning how to read. And by study, he puts them into fMRI machines. You can actually watch their brains functioning as they're learning the process of reading. And what he's discovered, what he argues, 
is that if books and libraries have played a predominant role in the cultural evolution of our species, and I think we can all agree that it has, it is because brain plasticity allowed us to recycle our primate visual system into a language instrument. The invention of reading, the invention of reading, this is his word, led to the mutation of our cerebral circuits into a reading device. We transform, because we developed writing, we transformed our brain into something that would be able to read written script. We're not born with that ability. It's unlike speaking. We're all born with the ability to speak. We're not born with the ability to read. We have to change our brains in order to read. And Dehaney has actually tracked this process. My guess is that if the first written systems, if we, if we had, if we could go back in time, and put people who were, learn, who were developing the first writing systems, put them in an fMRI machine, we watch their brains being changed, we watch them being transformed. Not everyone, of course, thought that writing was such a great thing. Socrates, or at least uh, Plato in one of his dialogues, quotes Socrates. I really do think this was Socrates that was saying this, not Plato. Because uh, as, as you may know from your ancient history, Socrates wrote nothing. Anything we have from Socrates that was written down by others, Socrates spoke, dictated, aloud, didn't write anything, for, and for reasons that I think should become clear. Socrates says, this discovery of yours, write it, this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learners' souls because they will not use their memories. They will trust to the external written characters and not remember of themselves. The specific which you have discovered, writing, is an aid not to memory but to reminiscence and you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things and will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. I read a quote like this and ask myself, was Socrates saying, writing is making us stupid? <laughs> Carr is particularly concerned, I think, about Google. He says, he didn't say, is the internet making us stupid? He says, is Google making us stupid? Now, when you read his book, he really is talking about the internet, and Google becomes sort of the, uh, the bogeyman in this whole process. He's particularly concerned about the statement by one of the founders of Google, Sergey Brin, who's been, who has big ambitions for Google, has big ambitions for the internet as well. He has said, Sergey Brin has said, if you had all the world's information directly attached to your brain or an artificial brain that was smarter than your brain, you'd be better off. And Carr is saying, no, we wouldn't. This is what we have to put a stop to, this sort of thinking. Google's motto is, don't be evil. Well, they're being evil right now, is what Carr and others are suggesting. And I'd like to, again, I'd like to sort of historicize this sort of, uh, the, 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 these sorts of statements both the attached to your brain part and the artificial brain part. Both of these seem unsettling to us. It certainly is unsettling to someone like Carr. The fear is that this external symbolic storage system that started with cave paintings and writing is now going to become intelligent, maybe even more intelligent than we are. And that's problematic for Carr and for others. But the other thing, of course, and I'll uh, come to this a little later, is the seemingly unnatural connection between the two, about this, this, this kind of intimacy with the technology that Grin talks about and Carr finds very unsettling. I'd like to sort of treat these both in turn. First of all, the idea that we would have some sort of global brain that would, uh, uh, that would give us all the answers, it doesn't start with Google, it doesn't start with Sergey Brin. The idea of encyclopedism, the idea of collecting all the world's knowledge, is an ancient impulse. I'll go a little more recently, and by recently here I mean about a century ago, with the uh, science fiction writer and futurist H.G. Wells, who described, he didn't describe the internet, but what he was describing certainly does sound an awful lot like the internet. He was talking about the technology of his day, and was particularly impressed with photography and film to a lesser degree. But he was saying that the whole of human memory will in a short time be made accessible to every individual. He was saying this, I think, in the 19, late 1920s. And what is also of very great importance becomes continually more frequent and unpredictable, that photography affords now every facility for multiplying duplicates of this, what are we going to call this? This all new, all-human cerebrum, part of the brain, that we're creating a new kind of cerebrum, he was saying. 
in the 1920s. It need not be concentrated in one place. We could have it scattered all over the place in Peru, China, Iceland, wherever the case might be. It can have at once the concentration of a cranial animal, it can be contained within a brain like an animal, and the diffused vitality of an amoeba, like a network. And people have looked at this and read this and said, aha, he was talking about the internet. He didn't realize he was talking about the internet, but he's talking about the internet, in effect, right? Um, he called it the world encyclopedia. He thought in world terms. He believed in world government, for instance. He was very, uh, very want to do these sorts of things. But many people look back and say what Wells was describing was something like the internet, using the technology of his day. And we've achieved, in a sense, what H.G. Wells was talking about. After the Second World War, Ben Alvar Bush uh, made, a, made similar sorts of observations. He was talking in particular about science after the Second World War, and scientists after the Second World War. And he described, or he invented, or uh, imagined a device he called a memex. A memex, which is a device in which an individual stores all his books, records, communications, and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. <laughs> it is an enlarged, intimate supplement to his memory, his here meaning a scientist. And this really struck me. In fact, I spent a lot of time in the book just exploring this whole concept right here. An intimate supplement to his memory. It consists of a desk, and while it can presumably be operated from a distance, it is primarily the piece of furniture at which he works. On the top are slanting translucent screens on which material can be projected for convenient reading. There is a keyboard and sets of buttons and levers, otherwise it looks like an ordinary desk. And cynics, he drew a picture of it, or there's a diagram of it in the article that he wrote, ironically enough, in the Atlantic in 1945. But he drew a diagram. This is a modern sort of updated, but that was the Memex. And cynics have looked at this and said, he's talking about the modern office cubicle with a desktop computer. In 1945, though, this was the intimate uh, extension of the scientist's memory. I look at something like the Memex. I look at someone like Vannevar Bush sitting at the Memex. And again, I can't help but to think of an update of St. Jerome in his study, that instead of books and calibers and globes, now it's motion pictures and books and all sorts of other information that, um, that, that Bush talked about. But again, there are people that were the, the, there are people that, that again say that Bush was one of the founders of the internet. The idea uh, that we could extend cognition like this across electronic networks. Uh, I suspect many in the room watched, or may have watched, or certainly heard about Watson uh, defeating the two greatest uh, human jeopardy players. This was about I think four years or so ago that Watson. Uh, that, 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 that Watson won at Jeopardy rather handily, too. I don't know if you watched the two days. Watson sort of cleaned up uh, pretty, pretty easily, as it turns out. And you may recall that Ken Jennings, after his, after his loss, said, I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. <laughs> yes. And this is the sort of the big concern. Ah, this is the demonstration. It started with Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov at chess in 1997. And that's when we started getting really worried. What else are human beings going to seed to computers, to big uh, parallel processing computers, like Watson. This is Watson here, by the way. Uh, I watched this, and our Columbus Futures group has had conversations about this. And what I said to that group was, uh, I'm, I'm actually not that impressed with Watson. Because at the end of the day, Ken Jennings can tell you the meaning of this loss, but Watson can't. And you can certainly query Watson, which is all Watson did throughout Jeopardy, right? He answered queries from Alex Trebek. But Alex couldn't say, so what are you going to do now? How do you feel about this? Watson simply is, I mean, and this is something that anybody in this room can do. Anybody in this room can do this. We may not win at Jeopardy, but we can answer those kinds of questions without much difficulty. Watson is, is a very, very, very good search engine. And in fact, if you want to couple it to experts, Watson can actually prove to be very, very helpful and very useful, not just simply for answering trivia questions. Do you know Watson is still alive today? This is Watson now. This is what IBM Research is doing with Watson. It is now an, a medical expert system. It is helping doctors uh, with uh, diagnosing, diagnosing patients, for instance. And if that sounds unsettling, I'm remembering uh, when my youngest son was much younger and we had to take him uh, one, one evening to the emergency room. The doctor, the, the, the doctor who was treating him, 
reached into his pocket and pulled out the physician's desk reference, which I think at the time might have, no, you know what? I don't think, even think it was in electronic form then. I think he still carried around a book because he was going to be prescribing something to my son, and he asked us, you know, what prescriptions is he on right now, and he wanted to find about drug interactions, any, any sort of problems like that. He doesn't keep all that information in his head. You consult the physician's desk reference in order to do this, right? Today, of course, that sort of thing is pulled up on a device like this, but all kinds of medical diagnoses can be aided, doctors can be aided, when you have an expert system like Watson, for instance. Uh, we just had a, uh, a referendum in Scotland uh, that was voted no. And you remember the slogan of the, uh, the no campaign was better together. I think that is the future of human beings and the internet. Better together. We will think and do things that we can't do alone. There are things that we can't do or that we would like to do that we can't do without the aid of technology. There are lots of things technology can't do that technology needs human beings to be able to do, like figure out the meaning of all of this, of all of this information. Keep in mind that Watson is uh, just a terrific search engine. The uh, futurist at Intel, Brian David Johnson, has coined a very useful uh, term to describe our current moment, uh, especially surrounding big data. And of course, big data is very much in the news now because of the uh, revelations of Edward Snowden, for instance, and what the, uh, what the NSA has been doing with big data. But Brian David Johnson uh, envisions the year 2020 as what he calls the secret life of data. That as we start to expel more and more and more information, machines and algorithms will hoover it up, run algorithms on it, and make, uh, make all kinds of predictions about it. And we won't know anything about it. This will be sort of carrying on without our knowledge. That's what he means by the secret life of data, that algorithms will talk to algorithms, machines will talk to machines, algorithms, sensors, cameras, gather data, and all this will go on, and it will be a rich and secret life separate from us. For him, incredibly fascinating. For others, maybe a little, uh, uh, a little difficult uh, to, uh, to comprehend or to deal with. But in a way, this world, the secret life of data is already happening right now. Algorithms are already working on data, and they're already starting to make suggestions to us, and to nudge us into certain kinds of behaviors. I'm sure you've already engaged in something like this, right? When you get, uh, when you go to Amazon and they say, you know what, you might like these books. Based on the, 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 the books that you've purchased before, you may like these books. And I don't know if you realize this, but Amazon is now starting in some areas of the country a pilot where they're not just simply going to suggest books to you, they actually mail them to you before you purchase them and say, you know, uh, maybe this is a book you'd like. You don't have to buy it, but we, we thought you'd like this book. There's a really interesting story, um, and it's, it's, it's not apocryphal. It actually did happen. Uh, there was a father, I think, in Minnesota who was, you've heard the story about Target, father uh, uh, in Minnesota who was ready to sue Target because they kept sending coupons and other sorts of mailers to his daughter uh, for things like uh, uh, baby wipes and diapers and these sorts of things. Say, you know, why are you doing this? You know, she's, she's a teenage girl. She's not pregnant. Well, it turns out a week later they found out, yes, indeed, she was pregnant. Target knew before the father <laughs> that his daughter was pregnant. Yes. Which is unsettling, but again, it's a, it's a demonstration of what we mean by the secret life of data. Now, you could also make, I think, a very convincing argument that we've been asking machines to do this kind of thinking for us for a while. This room is climate controlled because of a thermostat. In a sense, we've asked... We've asked a machine, keep this at a level temperature so it could be comfortable in the winter and cool in the summer. Right? We, we, it, it, this is a cybernetic tool. And one can argue this is what the, the future of the internet represents. It is but another cybernetic tool. It will do some thinking for us in the way that we allow lots of other devices to think for us or to think with us. Futurists have been pointing to what's being called the Internet of Things scenario. And what that means is that uh, in the Internet of Things scenario, all devices, not just simply what we assume to be electronic de information devices, all devices will be uh, both information producing and connected to all other kinds of information producing devices. So the example they love to give are like modern kitchens. All devices in the kitchen will be information producers and network to others. Your coffee maker, your refrigerator, your stove 
wherever the case might be. So here's a scenario for the future. I come home from the grocery one day, I go to my freezer, that pint of haagen ice cream. And I put that in the freezer, and then all of a sudden I get this message that says, Dave, are you sure you want to have that haagen -Dazs? Because the refrigerator will have sense that I bought haagen -Dazs and will have spoken to the medicine cabinet, or at least my prescription bottle, that knows I take statins. And says, is this really the sort of thing that you should be consuming? And in fact, that information's already been sent to my doctor, saying, you need to watch out. He's, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's not engaged uh, in, in proper diet here. Now, it's not telling me I can't have the ice cream, but there'll be some sort of reminder. Maybe it'll be my, my phone will buzz or something, or the refrigerator will talk to me and say, Dave, my name's Dave. Mm -hmm. Dave, do you really want to have that ice cream? That's what we mean by the Internet of, of, of Things scenario. And you know what? Maybe I need my devices to curb my appetites like that. Maybe I need that. I don't know if I want it, but maybe I need it. Narrative Science is a company that's recently formed that uh, has caused a lot of consternation, especially with writers sports writers in particular, but other kinds of writers. What narrative science will do is take information, statistics, numbers, spreadsheets, these sorts of things, run it through their algorithm, and out pops prose. So think about your kid's uh, baseball game, for instance. You can input all that data into their algorithms, and what comes out is a written account of the baseball game. And of course, sports writers are very concerned about what narrative science are producing. And people who write uh, corporate reports are concerned. You know, technical writers are very concerned about this sort of thing. And this is viewed as evidence that tools, technology, the internet is smarter than we are, taking over from, our, uh, taking over from human beings in some fashion. But again, narrative science algorithm, it's called Quill, is not conscious in the way that you and I are conscious. Again, all it does is produce rather turgid prose uh, about, uh, about uh, statistical uh, sorts, of, uh, sorts of objects. Uh, but again, it's sort of held up that we're letting technology race too far ahead of us and that technology is going to outpace human intelligence at some stage. In fact, there are some futurists that are quite uh, enamored of this kind of future. Ray Kurzweil is perhaps chief among them. Maybe you've heard of the term singularity. He didn't coin the term singularity, but he's certainly one who has uh, propagated it and is actually welcoming it with open arms. He, where Kurzweil, you should know, he's taking uh, like 200 vitamins a day. He wants to live, he's an, old, he's, he's an older guy, he wants to live to 2045, because that's when the singularity is going to come. He wants to be alive for it, so he can live, live forever. Because what's going to happen in 2045 is that our machines are going to, or the internet, computers, are going to reach a level of intelligence that they will be as smart and then soon smarter than we are. Smarter than we are. That's the singularity. That's the event horizon, 2045. His, this vision of the singularity is based on the idea that computers and the internet are going to be able to become more and more and more intelligent because they'll be able to process more and more and more information. And it's all based on Moore's law, which isn't really a law. It's mostly sort of an observation. But Gordon Moore, uh, who used to work at Intel, made the observation that computing power is doubling every 18 to 24 months. And in fact, it's been following a logarithmic scale. And it seems to be, you know, it seems to be working. 1971, 2011, yep. We've got this logarithmic scale where our, computer, where our, our, our processors, the chips inside computers, that allow us to process more and more and more information, make more and more calculations, that they're getting smaller, 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 smaller. And for people like the singularitarians, this is going to go on indefinitely. You just simply take that trend line and push it forward, and you get something that looks like this in, uh, in um, um, Kurzweil's book, that right now the internet is, uh, and, and all of our computing power, is about equivalent to an insect brain. But you just simply follow the logarithmic scale, and by about 2045, it's going to surpass all human brains. I think he is wrong. <laughs> Very wrong. Because of the assumption that this is going to continue on and on and on. There are physicists now that are saying Moore's law 
the doubling of computing speed cannot happen, cannot keep, continue to happen indefinitely. We're gonna, and I'm not gonna bore you with the physics of it, but we reach physical limits. We just can't make things smaller, any smaller. Electrons start to leak out of any device that we make. We're not gonna be, in fact, Gordon Moore said, this can't last indefinitely. The whole singularity is based on the idea that we're gonna have computing power that's just gonna go on and on and on, the, the, and, and on and on indefinitely, and that's what's gonna bring with the singularity. I think Kurzweil is gonna be very disappointed if he makes it to 2045. Very, very <laughs> disappointed as a result. We, I said that we are better together with our machines. I don't see the internet as a threat. I see it as we have with every other cognitive technology with which we have engaged as human beings. And the designer, Donald Norman, has made the observation that it looks something like the relationship between a horse and a rider. Here are two brains that have learned how to work together. They are better together as a result. And this is what the future of the internet looks like. We will be better together with our tools, and we will learn to cooperate and work together in the same way that a horse and rider work together. Does this mean that the internet is emerging as a brain, as Sergey Brin would, would have it, or as H.G. Wells even saw it? There's at least one, one person, the, neurobiologist, or the neuroscientist Jeff Steibel, who said, yes, the internet is a brain. Today, right now, the internet is a brain. It's just not a human brain. If you're comparing it to a human brain, well, that's, that's the wrong comparison. There are lots of brains on the planet right now. Insects have brains, horses have brains. The internet is a brain, the same way that these other creatures have brains. And we will learn how to coordinate with this other brain, this other intelligence that we've created. How will we interact? How will we interface? So Google Glass, or something like it, might be one way that we will interface. We are to the stage now where the memex is in something like our pockets, right? We can carry on a memex in our pockets. Soon, we'll carry on something like this within our peripheral vision. Does this guy look familiar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got to try on Google Glass. It was, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a thrill to be wear Google Glass. Google Glass itself is probably on its way out, but some sort of device like this where we'll be able to um, uh, see information projected onto the, onto the physical world. That, I think, is a real possibility over the next 20 to 25 years or so. How that interaction works, I think, is, is in the details. It might be something like Google Glass. It might be something in the form of an implant. And this really terrifies people. You mean computers are going to be directly implanted in my brain? Yes, I see that very much as a possibility for the next 20 years or so. And in fact, it already happens right now. I don't know if anybody in the room has a cochlear implant. Anybody in the room have a cochlear implant? You've certainly seen people with cochlear implants. That is a computer connected directly to the brain. And so something like that might emerge where we will connect to the internet through implants and interfaces uh, like cochlear implants or like these sorts of devices. There are now experiments. You don't even have to have sort of direct connections. There are experiments now where you can have these, these, these connections to a computer and just simply by thinking, you can move a cursor around on a screen. This is not science fiction, this is happening today, right now. With a thought, you can move a cursor around. The most immediate applications will be for quadriplegics, who will be connected in such a way, and again, this is, this is how I move my hands right now. My brain is sort of telling my fingers to do this. And we think in the future that quadriplegics will be able to do something like this, using these kinds of brain uh, implants. But the question will be, is this something that ordinarily healthy people are going to want to do? To have implants put in to be able to draw all the information, all the junk information, all the wisdom of the internet directly to our brains. That is certainly a future. This is a film that I like to show uh, some of my students. And you can, you can it's, it's, it's on the internet, you can, you can watch it. It's called Sight, it's about a 10 minute film. But what I want you to see here is that the characters, uh, you can't see it very well here, he's got implants in his eyes. And when he goes out on a date, this is what he's seeing when he's going out on a date with this woman. Here's all her Facebook information over here. So you know, he knows what, you know, what kind of wine she likes, you know, you know, knows her hobbies and those sorts of things. He already knows this sort of thing. This is obviously a trivial example, but the sort of vision that some have for the way that we will interact with information 
quite beyond our ability to push a button like this. Um, one of the um, areas of research that I'm particularly interested in, I don't know how far I'm going to take this, but one of the areas I'm particularly interested in is the idea of converting information into ways, not just simply that we'll be able to connect to our brains, but we'll, but we'll be able to apprehend information through all of our senses. So that a breeze, will, the, 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 the air I feel coming over my, uh, my skin, will be a kind of information. Or a sound that I hear will be a kind of information. Uh, or uh, some sort of tactile object that I'm able to manipulate. In other words, all of our senses, not just simply our eyes or ears, becomes a receptacle or a receiver for information. This is something called the ambient room, which was developed at MIT about 15 years ago, which does something very similar. There's sound and water ripple shadows and airflow. Again, this is not airflow in the way that we have airflow in here. That airflow is information in the same way that a visualization, some sort of a graph is sort of visual information. This would be sort of haptic information. Everything in the room would be uh, information. And someone sitting there would be able to apprehend all that information in the same way that, that the memex was a way to apprehend information or St. Jerome in his study. But I see this as sort of the next generation of these sorts of devices that we use to think with. Um, Peter mentioned the Goldberg Center is, a, among other things, a technology center in the history department. And, is a, and as I'm not a technologist, but I'm someone who knows a little bit about technology, and that marks you as someone that knows how to solve problems, right? Help me turn on my computer, help me solve this, this sort of problem. So my staff and I are constantly getting uh, 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 these, sorts of, uh, uh, these sorts of questions. And uh, I want to put this cartoon up. This is uh, from the, uh, the comic XKCD. And it's addressed to various parents, grandparents, co-workers, and other not computer people. We don't magically know how to do everything in every program. When we help you, we're usually doing something like this. Uh, find a button which looks related to what you do. I can't find it, so pick one at random. I tried them all. Google the name of the program plus a few words related to what you want to do. Follow any instructions. Did it work? Yes. You're done. We don't keep all, and programmers and other technologists tell you, we don't keep all that information in our heads. A lot of us are Googling it and using our judgment to find the best information. This describes our current internet moment. And what I hope I've demonstrated here is that this activity is not something that was invented with the internet. It's something that human beings have been doing since the beginning of recorded history. Thank you very much. There were some that said they wanted to leave at 6 o'clock for other obligations, but we were going to leave a half an hour or so for questions, conversations, dialogue. Before we do that, I'm very interested in your questions. I want to make certain to uh, recognize my two assistants who've been uh, uh, helping out here. Jessica Watson is in the back of the room there. She is technically a work-study student, but she has in the, what, two months or so she's been working in the center, become uh, as much a regular part of our staff as anybody, I think, uh, that we've hired here. And Laura Seeger is uh, our web and uh, uh, e-learning coordinator uh, in the department, and she's uh, graciously uh, been manning the camera this evening. Uh, we, are, we are recording this. This, uh, this presentation will be up on the Clio Society website in about a week or so. Uh, so you'll be able to watch it again, and we can share it with friends as well. So thank you, those of you that tuned in to watch this. Do you have questions or thoughts or comments or Concerns? Yeah. What's your view on what's going to happen with the internet now that there is a push at the UN and other global agencies to try to tax, uh, regulate, uh, and otherwise change how the internet functions as compared to today? Uh, dramatic. Dramatic. So uh, not for purposes of this lecture, but one of the chapters uh, of my book is called Limits. A lot of our assumptions about the future of the internet is based, like for instance, that uh, computing power will, will increase indefinitely are based on there not being any limits. And one of the limits I see to the future development, the, the, the future sort of connection between the brain and the internet is the interference from governments, the interference from other sort of nefarious entities, I think. Uh, we could very well see, 
so the example I give in the book is we're having difficulty right now mustering the courage to deal with our physical infrastructure. Roads, bridges, these sorts of things, right? The internet is based on a physical infrastructure that someone has to maintain. And there's no guarantee in the future that that infrastructure is going to continue to remain in place. Someone has to maintain it. And those who maintain it control that internet. So let's have this conversation in Iran. Let's have this conversation in China. It's a very different conversation, I think. Is that the sense in which you meant it? Yeah. That's the sense I, I took it, so. I'm just interested now that you know, it's exploding all over the place. And now suddenly you have, like you said, governments and various other yes. entities that want to figure out how to control it or tax it. That's right, yes. Shut it down or change it. All of these assumptions are based on sort of the free flow of information across the net, and that is far from guaranteed. Go out 30 years, uh, uh, the internet might be, uh, 50 years, the internet might be a memory, a memory that we have. Sir. Um, sort of a related question. Um, I've been peripherally involved in digital artwork for 20 years, and I sort of parallel the whole transition from analog to digital, and one of the words that enthusiasts constantly bring up in, in uh, discussions of new capabilities, the word democratizing, you know, like digital desktop will democratize design, and it never really does, and there are certainly moments in which the promise seems real, like the uh, use of internet in the era of spring, for example, Right. but then um, nefarious forces, as you of them uh, come back into play, and the promise is never really completely realized. In my own field in graphics, this has been borne out. There was a very brief period of time when it seemed like you couldn't do anything at home in your living room. And then HD and new formats and new technologies kick in, and it actually becomes very expensive again. Yes. Um, so there's that, and the kind of parallel interest, this isn't so much a question as just kind of a, a thought, I'm curious. Um, Mars would be, but there's also um, in all of these very utopian discussions of future capability, there's rarely ever a discussion of the actual cost. Right. And um, I think our marketing language aggravates this problem. For example, just the term the cloud. Every time somebody talks to me about the cloud, I kind of half jokingly say it's not really a cloud. You know? <laughs> Right. It's actually, you know, massively air-conditioned server farm, probably <laughs> in the Arctic somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Nevada. Hugely expensive. Oregon. You know, and water issues, air conditioning, etc. So I call them the factories of the 21st century, I'm just, both in terms of their productive capability, but also their ecological impact. But I'm. I'm just kind of curious in your response to this idea that any discussion of capability is incomplete without a discussion of cost. Oh, by, uh, by all means, yes. No, I think that's absolutely the case. And to, uh, you said, you know, response to your thought, I also sort of flip it around this, to the sort of the demand side of the democratization you're talking about. What if we have access, let's assume we have access to all of this uh, information. What if we have nothing to say? <laughs> You get TMZ. You get uh, you get you get the, the junk information uh, across the internet. I talk a little bit in the book about this. I don't I don't I don't want to belabor it because too many people sort of assume the internet is nothing but junk information, uh, and so they, and, uh, or they point or, or it's being controlled by for-profit multinationals like like Google, to which I then say, well, what about the Digital Public Library of America? That was just started. About, that was just launched about a year or so ago. If you don't like Google Books, fine. Go to the Digital Public Library of America, uh, and and, and you know, there's 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 all kinds of other uh, uh, parallel examples like this. Uh, you're quite right, though, to point to costs. You're quite right, uh, and this 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 sort of parallels the observation I was making before that the internet is a physical infrastructure. It is a it is it is not just weightless information as we've been talking about it for the last 20 years or so. It is a physical infrastructure that has to be maintained and is uh, controlled by someone or something or some entity. The flip side, well, no, I'll come back to that one. I want to hear other sort of thoughts and observations. So you had your hand up earlier. Yes? Yeah. Please. I just, um, 
I watched this crazy show called Person of Interest, and mm. there's this uber computer in mm. this who sees everything. And the interesting thing I think about it is that it's been programmed supposedly to care, to be something more nearly human than Watson. And I just wonder what you think of that. Um, um. Okay, well, I was gonna give a, a, a smart aleck comment and then a more thoughtful one. The smart aleck one was, uh, that's science fiction. Yes. It's not gonna happen. But then the more thoughtful answer is, uh, and I go, I, I go back to Joseph Weizenbaum, who in the 70s developed the ELISA program, that essentially was, uh, it, 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 it essentially takes Rogerian psychology uh, or Rogerian uh, therapy into a computer environment. And so, uh, you, you, know, you ask a question to, you, you, uh, Eliza will ask you, uh, how are you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling really awful. And Eliza will say, why do you feel awful? Oh, I feel awful because I lost my job today. And again, it's all based on Rogerian principles and people don't even realize they're talking to a computer. But to say that the computer is thinking or feeling or has, has any sort of emotion attached to it, again, that's science fiction. We might be, we might convince ourselves that our machines uh, that we have an emotional connection to our machines. If you've seen the movie Her, for instance, that's a that's a, a beautiful, really terrific film that explores this. But for machines to develop that kind of capacity is going to require them to, at a minimum, mimic our brains. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see it. I, I, I'm deeply skeptical that that it will be able to that will be able to to accomplish that. The brain, and I say this in my book. The brain is the most wondrous invention in the universe, creation in the universe. The human brain is the most wondrous creation in the universe. There's nothing else like it in the universe. And I don't see our, I mean, machines will get very smart, very intelligent, maybe as intelligent as dolphins or something like that, dogs. They're not gonna be, they're not gonna be like us. They're not gonna be like us. And the danger is thinking that they're gonna be like us. So, uh, moving beyond the silica base, Computing microchip now. What, right. What the photonic chip? What it seems to me that it's for in history, that you're an expert in that, that you know there, there's going to be something next. And uh, I was just wondering, had you researched that? Sure. So uh, the question is that history has demonstrated that where we think we run into limits, we eventually surpass those limits, and human beings have long sort of surpassed those limits. And there are those that are talking, for instance, about uh, quantum computing that are talking about uh, DNA computing, in other words, using uh, organic materials as a way to provide, uh, or to engage in calculations. And there's some early research that suggests that it, 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 it could help us expand uh, our calculating abilities by using, again, uh, by, by in, DNA is nothing but information, a kind of one and zero, if you want to, or actually more complex than one and zero. And there are those that are saying that we might be able to do that with DNA, for instance. So yes, I'm not ready to, to dismiss uh, the, uh, the, the singularity idea. Uh, I'm just highly skeptical of it. I don't assume that it is, it is the inevitable future. I think it is a possible future, but not inevitable. Uh, that, that would create my second question. You talked about better together. Yes. And then in history, people, individuals like Copernicus or Einstein didn't work in Peru. And yet their impact on, on the evolution of our society much greater than some group of scientists at OSU. So yeah, the, the, uh, the, the observation is I've been told to repeat questions for the, for the camera, for, for, for folks watching here. So the question is that, um, that uh, you know, we use the language of better together, but some of our greatest thinkers in history thought by themselves. Copernicus, Kepler, and you know, maybe you mentioned Einstein. Newton, Einstein. Um, uh, and that's certainly, I mean, there, there's, there's a, a huge literature about the nature of creativity, invention, inno, uh, innovation, creativity. Uh, is it accomplished by geniuses? That's a, there's sort of two, two approaches to this. One is the romantic notion of the, in, the lone individual genius who thinks great thoughts. The other is a, not a collective notion, but that, uh, that, that, that great ideas come from the confluence of lots of, 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 lots of people uh, thinking together. You can't have an Einstein, and, and I think Einstein would say this, you can't have an Einstein without the Institute for Advanced Study, for instance. He was as much a part of that community and was nurtured as much by that community as it was his individual mind. And there are those that are saying that's what the internet provides. It's not so much uh, 
uh, machines connected to other machines, but it's human beings connected to other human beings. I'm going to blank on the mathematical problem. Um, I'm going to blank on the mathematical problem, but uh, there was a, an instance about four years ago where there was this intractable mathematical problem. Uh, a, uh, a mathematician had his own network. You didn't put this up on Wikipedia. This isn't up on, on, on you know, Twitter or anything like this. It's a network, a world network of mathematicians. He said, hey, let's try to solve this problem. 39 days later, to solve. All these mathematicians working together on the problem solved it in 39 days. Individual mathematicians working on it had been struggling with it for, for decades and decades. And the lesson from that is that we, be, when we're connected together, we can, uh, we, we can at least uh, uh, in theory, uh, think better together. That doesn't deny, though, that there are lone geniuses. But lone geniuses aren't the only way that new and great ideas, in fact, lone geniuses were, were probably part of some sort of, of, of community. Uh, connected together. Sean? Don't you think that, that there's a certain amount of uh, myth-making and Western influence to the uh, notion of the grand individual? I mean, it, 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 you don't find that so much in Eastern thought. So the question is, uh, is, the, is the romantic notion of the lone individual thinker, the lone individual genius, sort of a, uh, a myth that we in the West like to tell? And he contrasts that to uh, uh, the situation in Eastern philosophy, for instance. And I think there might be a little bit of truth to that. Now, I say that having uh, someone who's, who's written three books and thought about this is something I did on my own. When I really think about it, I haven't really done it on my own. Uh, in fact, this last book has been nurtured as much by the community that uh, this, you know, this community at Ohio State, this community here in Columbus, being able to have conversations with people like yourself, for instance. Uh, I cannot discount any of that. Uh, I'm not a hermit alone in the desert, which is, I think, the sort of image that someone like Richard Foreman tries to, to propagate. Uh, there certainly is that hermetic <coughs> tradition in Western society, and I'm not discounting that at all. But I think sometimes we're blind to the influence that, uh, that communities have uh, on our individual thinking. And we like the uh, simplicity of the story. I mean, the story and the myth that they, the, 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 um, the story and the myth are sort of like the, the beautiful packaging of whatever the gift. So, uh, and I always mispronounce his name, but Shesh Mahaley, the guy that wrote Flow, talks about creativity. One of his key arguments, I don't know if I'm, am, am I saying, Chick it's, being, high. It, it's being recorded, right? So I better I make sure I get it right. But he says that it's, it, it's insufficient, just, I mean, individuals can come up with great ideas. We don't think of them as creative until a group sort of says, yeah, that's a creative idea. I mean, in a sense, it's sort of you know, discerned by its value, its, its utility to a larger group. Maybe that's gotten us a little bit beyond the internet, but I think it was, it, it's still a useful direction well, to, to, to take us. Yeah. yeah. People gave Copernicus a hard time when he said Absolutely. the universe was organized differently. And, uh, and, and uh, Einstein, for that matter, right, right. to use I, that example. I don't think Shakespeare had a big writing group around him either. He didn't. No. Are you? And David, I, uh, there was this delicious, aggravating moment when your technology failed. And I thought, I'd like to hear you place that in the context of not the worry that our technology will become too powerful, but that we'll become reliant on it and it will fail. Um, I'm, okay with, uh, I'm okay with reliance on technology. Uh, I could have, uh, as, as I was sort of running it through my head, I was saying, I can do most of this until I get to the image of St. Jerome in his study. And in that sense, I'm going to have to rely on everybody in the room having a mental picture of St. Jerome in his study. And I can, I can paint with words St. Jerome in his study, but I'd rather you see it. And after you saw it, my guess is that it changed, right? It changed your thinking. This is why human beings developed art, to be able to do like what we did right there. So will our technology fail? Uh, absolutely, of course it will, just like my brain fails sometimes. What was your name again? I don't recall. I can't recall it either, right? Um, yes, our technology fails, uh, just like we fail. It is not infallible. It is, it, is, it is fallible as we are. All I'm suggesting is that it's not the threat that we make it out to be and that we, that, and that we are stumbling together throughout human history. We stumble with our technologies. Libraries burn to the ground, for instance, because you know, paper burns. Uh, we don't fault books because they can burn so easily, but they most certainly do. Uh, so technologies like Google are indexing, searching, searching it. That's right. Yeah. Not necessarily 
data or information creating. <clears throat> but then you have technologies like Wolfram and Alpha. Right. And that are actually in the process of creating new knowledge right. through the, the, you know, the <coughs> algorithms they have running in the background. What sort of impact, so it's sort of an internet of things because it's, so, it's a hidden network that's operating behind the scenes. But what, what sort of impact do you anticipate uh, tools like those and there are lots of others in, in different domains creating knowledge in the background without human so we can go lots of ways here. So uh, for, for everyone and for the cameras, the question was sort of comparing uh, Google as a, really a, a search and, and, and uh, an aggregator of information versus something like Wolfram Alpha. Uh, and that's something you can, you can Google that when you go home or you can Google it now. But this is, um, this is in, fact, I, in fact, I cite uh, the example of Wolfram Alpha in my book as a sort of a counterweight to something like Google. If you're concerned about Google, consider something like Wolfram Alpha which, uh, as we're suggesting here, is not just simply aggregating, but using algorithms to create new knowledge, drawing together information, seeing new patterns in it. Um, the algorithms designed by humans, but in a sense being left to sort of run on their own in that sense. There's sort of two ways we can look at this. On the one hand, we will think with Wolfram Alpha. This will be, again, just another way in which humans and our artificial brains will be working together. We will come to rely on the insights and observations of Wolfram Alpha in the same way that I'm relying on the insights and observations of everybody in this room. That Wolfram Alpha will be as a sort of a co-equal partner in the conversations that we have. There's another scenario that, 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 that I explore in the book, and that I wasn't going to explore here, but I'll explore it here. We can also reach a stage where our machines, like Wolfram Alpha, won't be emotional, they won't have be conscious necessarily, uh, they, won't, uh, they won't say you want to go out for a drink afterwards or the, or the computer equivalent thereof. But they might sort of work at such a secret level that they might be engaged in their own kind of society that we will have no knowledge of. It'll be like, I don't know, like ant society or the way in which dogs communicate with each other. We have no idea. Why does a cat go running through the house? Or why do dogs do what they do when they meet each other? We have no sort of sense of this. Maybe our machines will engage in a similar kind of society. We will see things happening. We want to understand what it is. We're already seeing some sense of this today. So when the stock market all of a sudden drops 500 points, people say, well, you know, what happened? Because the algorithms got, you know, either buggy or they, uh, the, 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 something happened in the algorithms. And it had nothing to do with human beings. Nothing at all to, human, to do with human beings. That sort of scenario I think could happen where, again, they're not conscious beings. That requires, I think, a, a level of computation. We're just not there yet. But there could be a society of machines of which we're just simply not a part. Does that make the world more fragile or more robust? I don't know how to answer that. If it makes a society more fragile or anti-fragile or more when robust. You use the example of financial markets as a much yeah. more fragile system. If you use a ant-like system, it's a much more Buses. Yeah. So, I guess my response would be it de would depend on how well the system is designed. And I think designers have a huge, important role to play in the way in which our devices are designed and the way in which we interact with them. And I'm looking at one of my design students as I as I as I say this. Um, that that interface between the human brain and our technologies is going to be the most important design decision of the next 20 years or so. So get on it, Kyle, right now. <laughs> I, think, um, I think it's a really interesting question. And it does depend on design, but I think it also depends on- Designers. Um, designers, yes. but I also think it depends on who ultimately um, has ownership of the system. And yes. You mentioned a scenario in which you think it's starting to happen already, the stock market, which we know is computer driven now. But if I can just bring a little bit of paranoia into the room, <laughs> I think that one man's paranoia is another man's um, mission creep analysis. Because I think it's also happening on another level. If you want to define computers and robotics as essentially data driven and rule set driven, you could also describe um, legal systems and corporate charters the same way. And, right. and I see 
in our culture today a kind of a very slow, somewhat insidious um, kind of takeover of data-driven decision making. And it's happening on the legal level, it's happening on the corporate level, it's happening on the um, synthetic level, the, the computer level. And so what I'm, what I'm really concerned about, this kind of invisible culture that you're referencing, that it's actually already happening, and there's really nobody in charge of it. So, uh, I don't disagree with your observation. That doesn't make me paranoid. I just think that, I just think that's a very sensible observation. That there's this, there's this, um, um, there's this shadow, shadow electronic reality. Uh, so let me uh, let me give you the, uh, the the David version, right? Or the way that in which I see this. Again, I don't see anything inevitable about this. I pre and, and, and as someone who's a, a practicing futurist, I never make predictions. I simply think in terms of scenarios, possibilities in which the future might unfold. And here's a possibility I'm seeing. This, this summer, uh, there was a court case in Barcelona, uh, the so-called right to be forgotten uh, ruling. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. So some, yeah, so you heard this. Someone sued uh, Google because uh, he wanted, it, so, 15 years earlier, he had been sued and he had uh, gone into bankruptcy. Uh, and he had since gotten into a, be a better financial, in fact, a really fine financial situation. Yet when you Google his name, the first thing that comes up every time is this financial trouble that he had 15 years ago. And he wants that record expunged. And the European Court of Justice said, yes, you can do that. And so I see a scenario where people are going to want to take more control of their information, not give it away for algorithms to hoover up and to, and to uh, make algorithms, because you cannot have that kind of future without big data. And if, and if lots of people decide, I don't want to give up my data, that system simply can't function, no matter what nefarious groups want to make it function. Uh, that's not to say that it's inevitable, but I see that as a very real human future where people decide, I want to be, I want to be left alone. I don't want my, inf I, my information belongs to me. The memory of me belongs to me. And now we have court precedent to suggest that might be the case. Steve? Yeah, I very much agree with you better together. Oh, okay. And I very much agree with you uh, that there are some wonderful things that we can do with the internet. So uh, it's not the internet that I'm afraid of, like you. It's the internet in the hands of some people. <laughs> okay. Which I'm people? afraid of the, well, uh, people with, uh, I hate to use the word evil, uh, but let's just use that as a placeholder. Uh, cyber terrorism. Sure. Uh, going into people's bank accounts and stealing money. Uh, any number of frauds uh, that can be uh, committed online. I find that very, very scary. Uh, but there's something more, and that is, it's very easy today to confirm your prejudices. And I think that has a real impact on lawyers, doctors, and professors. Because what's going to happen in the future is more and more people are going to come in with preconceived ideas and information that may not be consistent with professional best practices. Doctors are already yes. fighting this with patients. Uh, lawyers face people who have misconceived ideas about what the law says because they read part, but they didn't read the whole body of the law. That's right. And then professors are going to have this challenge, uh, and I see a shift in the practice of, of professors, and, uh, and I disagree with me if you will. You're going to face a lot of students who come into the class with preconceived ideas and say they have facts. Yes. We already lot, do. And a lot of time is going to be spent in, well, let's check these facts. Are they confirmable facts? And let's talk about uh, your interpretation, because your interpretation comes from a particular angle. I, uh, I knew a professor 50 years ago who said that people go to college to confirm their prejudices. And I find that statement very thought it was ridiculous at first. Now it starts to worry me. <laughs> Comment on that. Because you've been a professor uh, in, in, your, in your long career, so you know where to speak. Um, there was a commercial that uh, appeared a few years ago. I think it was for um, 
it was for uh, some sort of um, financial services. Uh, I, you know, Charles Schwab or one of those. I can't remember exactly which one it was. But it was challenging this notion that you can make your own trades, right? Do it yourself. We provide you the tools. You can, you can, you can make your own trades. And the way they commented on this is, and, and the, the, the ultimate argument is, you're still going to need an expert. You still want to confer with someone who is knowledgeable. And the example is a guy sitting in his kitchen with like some kitchen knives and things, and he's on the phone with a doctor saying, well, you got all the knives right there. You can just make an incision right there. You should be fine. Mm -hmm. And the idea is eventually, you know, you can go to WebMD, you can do all those sorts of things, but eventually you're going to have to go and talk with a, with a doctor who is knowledgeable, right? And I think that, that this, and this, the situation you describe right now, Steve, is absolutely, absolutely spot on. I think we are in a, a cultural moment right now where expertise is challenged and undervalued, right? So expertise of whomever it might be, uh, because I can access whatever sort of information I want, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think that the cycle is going to turn around. I, I, I'm not going to predict when it is, but I see us getting out of the cycle where there will be a return to expertise, to knowledgeable people, that we will want knowledgeable doctors, we will want knowledgeable lawyers, we will want knowledgeable uh, professors uh, to help us with the information that we have at our disposal. Right? And the use of it. Sorry? And the use of it. And the use of it, yes. Uh, I absolutely see that, but but I, again, I think your description of where we are at the moment is absolutely spot on. Yes. Well, David, thank you very much for a very stimulating talk and a very impassioned uh, discussion. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, before, before we adjourn, I would like to make one uh, commercial, or maybe two, for the Department of History. Um, as was suggested earlier, the Cleo Society tries to have a couple meetings like this per year. Uh, we haven't yet set the next one, but we anticipate it being sometime in the spring semester. It'll be on a topic other than uh, computers in the future. We'd like to find a faculty colleague who has recently published a big book or a major article and give him or her a chance to convey that new knowledge to the general public. So if you'd like to be part of that society um, and uh, make sure that Dave or Steve or I have some contact info for you and we'll put you on our email distribution. And check out the website. Or yes. look on the History Department website which is regularly updated. Um, and clio.osu.edu. That's where the videos, and you can see videos of uh, previous. Constructive use of the internet. Yes. <laughs> right. um, secondly, the history department has a lot more activities open to members of the public, um, including um, alumni and friends tours of foreign sites, including various public lectures and public forums, including access to certain classrooms. If you'd like to connect with the history department at some other level, uh, make sure I have your contact info. And on that note, one week from tomorrow, coincidentally, we are hosting our fifth annual open house. Uh, it's on a Saturday. We schedule these on football game days. I hope that's okay with everyone uh, because it's a time when all, a lot of our alums and friends are back on campus anyhow. So a week from tomorrow at 5 p.m. in Dulles Hall, the History Department building, will gather for two and a half hours, uh, 5 to 7.30, with kickoff of the football game being at 8. If you happen to go into the game, uh, consider please joining us for a little while ahead of time. Let me know if you're interested in that, and I'll make sure I email you up-to-date information early next week and put you on our RSVP list so we can plan accordingly. If you're not a football fan, come anyhow, um, and at least be driving home against traffic, so to speak, when you're finished visiting the history department. Thank you for your time and attention this afternoon. Join me again, and thank you. For your